President Huber, uh, dear Clemens, dear Jean, dear colleagues and friends, thank you all for coming here and uh, giving, uh, honoring me by, by your presence. And thank you for the lovely music uh, that I really enjoyed. I want to just say a few words back to Sean, uh, because we have been uh, so for friends for so long, uh, that uh, one thing is that you hasn't, you didn't, oops, they went my <laughs> whole speech. Okay, so, uh, you didn't realize that, you know, the fact that I left that uh, thesis in the car and didn't take into the hotel room uh, shows that I had no inkling of how valuable it was. So it wasn't just the thief that had a problem with that. And uh, the other observation is that uh, while you graduated after me, uh, actually you, have, you always get these prizes before me. But a little consolation is the fact that uh, the first, uh, the, this prize took 20 years for me to get, and the Nobel Prize only two years, so maybe I'm catching up. Uh, and one day even get ahead of you. But uh, it doesn't matter, Sean. Uh, you have been such a big part of my, my career, and I want to really thank you. And it is a big reason why I'm being honored here, and I feel extremely honored by this prize, yeah, and, and uh, never did I even think for a minute that I wouldn't come here. Uh, I did think for a while whether I should go to Stockholm, because it, I could be tired. But, uh, no, this, this means a lot to me, and, uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Uh, let me say that this title, Money Markets and Financial Intermediation, is uh, for all three lectures, uh, and uh, I won't speak much about fin financial intermediation today, but tomorrow uh, there's a lecture on banking, and then there's a third lecture uh, that's a little different. Uh, I want to, this is a topic that I have worked uh, on together with uh, Gary Gorton and Trivi Dang and Guillermo Ordonez uh, ever since uh, the 2008 crisis because I had the good fortune to comment on a paper by uh, Gary Gorton at the Jackson Hole Conference, which is one of the big conferences uh, or the biggest uh, banking conference. and uh, and. Uh, he spoke about the panic of 2007. He was probably one of the first to remark that the panic was ongoing as we met. And, uh, and that inspired me to some comments that uh, led to our cooperation. So this, uh, this work is very much uh, part of, of Gary and Trivi and Guillermo as well. So uh, like, uh, like uh, Sean mentioned, I do like to pick topics uh, for my research on, uh, that uh, is uh, somehow goes against the stream. My mother would say, if she was here, she's still alive and all, but uh, she would say that's the way I was ever since I was born, uh, always going against some sort of stream. But uh, the, the interest, uh, it is especially interesting if I find something where I think that uh, what everybody else thinks, or most everybody else thinks, is somehow uh, not the way I think things are. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's a real prelude to this topic. That's how I see it, and, and I hope that uh, it will raise some thoughts in your mind as well. So. Uh, let me start by saying, since the audience is so big, that just a word about what money markets mean. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a precise term, but it's, uh, it is about uh, what we call wholesale markets, meaning big amounts, units being traded, very low risk, high liquid, all of them debt contracts, 
of some sort, short-term debt, less than a year is the typical um, cutoff point. So this is a gigantic market, and, uh, and that totally dwarfs you know, the stock market. It's an it's a order of magnitude bigger. Uh, unit trades can be 100 million uh, per trade or up to a billion dollars a trade. So we are talking about the gigantic market that, uh, that people actually don't pay that much attention to. It includes treasuries. So in fact, the treasury itself, the Fed itself is involved in the market. That's where you get the billion dollars trades. Agency debt, meaning agency debt refers to government. Uh, GSEs, that is government su supported a entities. CDs, commercial paper. Bankers acceptances, notes, repos, ABCPs. The repo is something that I want to come back to because that was at the very center of, uh, of the financial crisis. It's also a market that had a lot of innovation and uh, running up to the financial crisis. I should say that these are all debt markets. Debt is an exciting instrument, much more exciting than equity, in the sense that there's just infinite variations on the theme of debt, whereas equity tends to be fairly simple. But for some reason, finance uh, has paid very little uh, attention to that before the crisis. Uh, I mean, technically, yes, but the, all the excitement has almost been in the, in the equity market, money markets uh, were treated as a, as a little corollary of sorts. Uh, that may be a little unfair to say, but uh, I would say the finance courses I took, uh, money markets, except for pricing debt, uh, were not uh, particularly interesting. So let me talk uh, about the thing that changed all of this. There's a lot of interest today in money markets. And, and the financial crisis that happened is, uh, and to some extent is still ongoing, is what changed everything. And I want to speak, uh, I'm setting myself up now for the common view of the causes of the crisis. That is how people saw the crisis uh, shortly after it happened, and um, many people uh, see it still. It is the view that uh, the reasons for the crisis had a lot to do with Wall Street greed and wrong incentives, uh, complex securitized uh, structured products, opaque products, uh, asset-backed securities, very hard to read what, what, what was inside, you know, these so-called bags of pieces or mortgages and such. And then on top of it, uh, these were rated by uh, rating agencies, as they typically are, uh, very much off in many people's views, exposed, looked at it. 80, up to 80% of, of, of the products were in various ways received AAA rating, that is the highest rating. Uh, a lot of them uh, uh, proved to not be worthy of the AAA rate. So Michael Lewis is big short. I don't know how many people have uh, seen the movie, but it's actually a great movie. It's an interesting movie, and it's a perfect movie to set me up for my main point. So let me get to that point. I hope that it's called the big short also in, 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 the, in here in Germany. The storyline, it's, it's an it's a interesting story, but uh, I would summarize it as the main question is, how could Wall Street trade without knowing really anything? Or put differently, how could it be that only five people, you know, or, or, uh, or so, uh, had any idea of what was going on, and these fellows actually in the movie go on down to Florida and knocks on doors and finds out that these people have no money and they have no income and they are, uh, uh, you know, the prices are below. So the idea is somehow a little book, like five guys going to Florida would have told everybody that this was all based on, 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 on uh, a, a weak foundation, if foundation at all. So uh, that's the story, uh, and in response to that story, or that uh, kind of sense that people have, is the universal call, one would say almost universal call for more transparency. That the way to never have this happen again, one of the things we can agree all on is that you know, we should be able to see what are we trading really. That seems like a no-brainer, 
And in fact, that's the way I used to think about it myself uh, until I learned otherwise, or thought I perhaps. And so here is the alternative view uh, to just contrast against that common view. That, that the reason people didn't know what they were trading is because that's just the way the money markets are supposed to work. Not only was there a little marginal change in, you know, okay, they did this and that. My assertion in this talk is that's exactly how the money markets are supposed. There's nothing to be surprised of. I'm putting it very starkly. Almost nothing to be surprised of in terms of their behavior. And it was those five people, one of which was especially eccentric. I remember, did he, was he called Michael Burry or something like that? You know, Michael Burry was an eccentric guy. You know, there's a reason only five people really went down to Florida and looked at things. It relates to Badgett, who is a wise man that people talk about a lot in these contexts. He said early on in the 18th, 19th century, something that relates exactly to this. Every banker knows that if he has to prove he's worthy of credit, in fact, his credit is gone. That is, if I have to show you what is in the bag and show you that, you know, it has, that I'm, or if I'm a bank and I have to somehow open up, you know, my balance sheet and tell you where I have invested the money in great detail, the game is over. This is a game of trust is what budget is saying. And you hear it from traditional bankers, and I think of, of uh, Germany as, as the heartland of traditional banking, is, you know, you are not supposed to have to show things. You are supposed to earn it in other ways, to which I come, uh, which could be expressed as trust. So another sort of provocative way of stating is that in money markets, ignorance is bliss or almost bliss. And I will come to, so this is the position I'm going to try to defend today or explain to you. Uh, so I will start by doing the logic of money markets, contrast it especially sharply with stock markets. I think the biggest mistake we are making is we have living out of the view that's coming from stock markets and applying it to money markets which has been so long neglected with re regard to this view. And then I provide some evidence of logic, the main evidence being the crisis itself. I will explain not only why they didn't collect information in advance, I will connect that to, that's connected to the, the fact that uh, that crisis happened. These two go hand in hand, so to speak. And then I will come up to, with some policy implication of logic. So this is not just some philosophy or interpretation of what's happening. It's meant to also give you an idea of, of, of what this change in perspective on this particular matter already tells you something of, uh, or, or several things of uh, value when it comes to policy. In fact, I am of the view that it is really important to to the extent it's even somewhat true what I'm going to say, and I'm pretty sure about that, uh, it al already is going to be important. So here is a common, and for, I start with a false inference. That is, there's a logical flaw in the way both economists and laymen think about this issue. About, and, uh, and so all economists realize that symmetric information about payoffs means that it's a liquid payoff. It's a payoff that way I don't have to worry why is Sean paying me with you know, dollars or something like that. I know what a dollar is. In fact, I know, notice I have no idea what really exactly backs up the dollar, except for the faith of, there's a statement in every bank in the US about the faith and trust in the government. But, but that trust goes, just ask Argentinians. Or for that matter, in the 30s or whenever it was, Germans. Uh, so it's not that the government, it's even the government can fail, but symmetric information about payoffs implies liquidity. The fourth step is to say that transparency implies symmetric information. That's the logical step that obviously is, this is just factually true in, in so many ways in, in economics one can show, 
And, uh, but we do that because we somehow think that if we are transparent about everything and we put everything on the table, then we all have the same information. The flaw is beginning with, first of all, it's very hard to, whatever you put on the table, I have had a different life than you have had. And you, it's not enough to put just the information at hand on the table, say, about problems. It's also important to tell everything of how I see uh, information about, say, asset-backed securities or something like that, even if you gave every piece of information from that, that uh, particular security. And uh, so we have different experiences, and therefore just putting things on the table is, is going to... Uh, not lead to symmetric information. And I will come to examples just in a second that you will show you a little more of how that may be possible, but you may think for the moment, for instance, of the fact that if the stolen car, that, uh, now my car that was stolen, if, if, we are, if me and a mechanic is bidding on that stolen car, and all we know you know, it's a, it shows up somewhere in some auction because it was stolen. If that person sees, uh, uh, the mechanic sees just the same as I do from a distance, that is, I can't, we can't go and touch it, we just hear what the, what the course characteristics are, it's a Volkswagen as it were, it is, you know, that year, particular year model, I think 74 as I recall, and so on. If you get that information, I'm pretty much on the same page with the mechanic. That is, we can bid, I can bid. But lo and behold, if the me mechanic goes and sees, you know, or gets to drive the car or something like that, I'm, going, I'm no longer going to bid. Because he knows so much more than I do. Because he's a mechanic. So that's the example, that's one example of how the history of one's life has a big and important uh, role in playing whether, how one reads exactly the same information. So expertise, you might call it, is really a significant part to be concerned with. So uh, we can, there are two ways to get to symmetry information. As we shortly see, investors know everything of relevance in stock markets. That's the African market hypothesis. The information that is of relevance and kills every expertise, basically, based on a lot of empirical evidence is you know the price. Every second almost you know the price. The price beats every other particular. It just silences the expertise and leads to paradoxes that I don't want to get into here, how that information even gets into the price. But basically price is a sufficient statistic of everything we need to know about the stock. Of course, there's all the time people who think they can beat the stock market, but on the whole, this is an accepted truth. A much easier way, apart from such, but it's very expensive, as we'll see, the, to get the price. Apart from that, symmetric ignorance is often a lot easier to, to get to. Basically, in the case, I just gave you the example of not showing, being opaque and not showing things to the experts is a good start for getting symmetric information, and therefore, that's what I call symmetric ignorance here. But you will also see that over-collateralized debt is going to be the key instrument in the markets that I'm talking about. So uh, let's go and see an example of, a, a, a quickly, an example of a, the logic that comes from pawn shops. Pawn shops have been around, it turns out, you know, at least 2,000, 3,000 years. You read, depending on which history book you read, it's very old. The way they, they, it is very much a market about not discovering the price. That's the whole idea. Because it's a lot cheaper. And so I take the example of, if, you know, if I had to sell a watch in order to raise some money, say, and I think it's my grandfather's watch, it's worth $500 for me, the guy's offering me $100 or maybe $50, I don't know. How, how, am, I, how am I going to get money? Well, there's a brilliant solution. And that is, I say, okay, so you get it for $100. That's what we agree on. But I have to be able to buy it back tomorrow or within some month or whatever. When I have the money, I will back it, buy it back for $100 plus interest. So we notice the fact that I'm allowed to buy it back 
is the key to actually not having to haggle over the price. Is it 500, is it 600, is it whatever? So it's a form, formally this actually the same as a secured debt contract where a, the, 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 the watch is collateral. But I'm taking that pawn shop as an example because it has exactly the structure of repos, where repo also is a, a, a seemingly strange contract where I'm buying a security today from you and simultaneously will agree as I'm buying it that I will buy it back tomorrow. Most of them are actually one-day contracts. And that's the repo is a $3 trillion market. It's some, when I first heard it, you know, I'm buying, I'm, I'm, you are buying my thing and then I'm promising to buy it back. What, what does it exactly mean? And what it really means, if I want to think about it, is, I think importantly, that it's a substitute for deposits. The one-day contract is a substitute for a banking account. When you have a billion dollars to deposit, no amount of insurance will cover it. Because there is no, you know, you get 250,000 or a million in the US for each bank. But if you have hundreds of millions, you, that is no good. So this comes, it's critically important that uh, in order to be willing to deposit something and fund something with, say, a unit of 100 million, or just park it there for tomorrow, it is critically important that something else than a promise is held. And that is, uh, uh, that is where the collateral comes in in a big way. And that is where what we call the shadow banking system and its sort of production of collateral, rather than the traditional banking system, come in a big way to play. It's just reinventing, so to speak, the old pawn shop at a much more sophisticated and, and, and interesting level. So it is a parking space. The whole shadow banking system can be viewed in that sense as, a, of course, a funding place, but also usefully as a parking space. And a critical element of that is that you, these, if you don't give me my money back when I'm asking for it, if tomorrow comes, and by the way, we roll it, typically we roll it over day by day, so that's why it's like a deposit contract. So it, 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 you, you may not check at all, or, or you may just say, now I want my money back. If you don't give me the money back, I can sell the asset that you gave me, which is typically something more than 100. If it's a 100 million uh, contract, you know, then, uh, then maybe 105 million is in, in collateral. So uh, this over-collateralized debt, I just want to go through it quickly. Debt is information insensitive, is the point. And it is information insensitive exactly because of the collateral that is more than covering the face value of the debt. That's the mechanism that Chinese used. I have, there's a contract, you know, in the book. You can see there's a pawn shop contract. That's the contract that they used. And it has all, I, it would be wonderful to talk more about these contracts because they are so sophisticated already thousands of years ago. Uh, they have a lot to do with, can you trust me to hold the collateral and so on and so forth, but I skip those details. Oh, I see. I have been pushing this. Okay, so uh, I just built up the red line here is the final value. So at the time this contract is supposed to be paid, this is the 45 degree line is the default. If I don't, the collateral value is, is uh, below the face value, say 100, then if the collateral value is only $90 or assessed to be in a, or guessed to be under, $90, I can pay back the $100, then we go into a default, which is the 45-degree line. Otherwise, it's flat. The debt just pays the $100. We draw it this way. There's a little interesting observation here, which is actually quite deep. We draw it always in the textbooks this way, as if we knew the collateral value, and therefore, you know, you can see, okay, the collateral value is 170, so therefore, I'm 100. I'm reading from this graph, you know, I'm on the flat line. Actually, that's not the way the debt contracts are written. They are written, you pay me back 100, and if you don't pay me back, you go into default. So this whole flat line is what we would economists call a state of nature. 
So this is actually uh, one of the interesting features of that, that they don't reveal states of nature. There's lots of state of nature in those. So I call it contingent price discovery, which happens when you go in default. Then we have to discover the price or whatever value is in the collateral. Uh, I seem to have. So I'm drawing one more picture here, is that if you back off from this, I, what I have put in here in addition is that there's a black line here now that, uh, that uh, you see right there, uh, you may not see, but that's, that's the market value of this debt days or months before this actually expires, that when you are supposed to pay it back. And the market value is an op is a priced like an option or an or or inverse of an option, you know, graphically. And the point I want to emphasize here is that if you calculate these, these prices for debt, if there is sufficient collateral, that is, if this blue line, this is the, dis oops, this is the blue, this is the distribution that's sort of measured here. It's a probability distribution. These are the possible values and the most frequent values in the middle here. Then, if it far out to the right, then the black and the red line are coinciding, essentially. So this is actually an almost riskless contract according to the market. And if you go further out by putting more collateral in, for instance, then it will truly be riskless. If you make this shorter, the black line will get closer to the red line. So ma short maturities mean that it gets closer and closer to the, to the red line. And therefore, the region where it is essentially in, in the money, as we say it, that is safe, is, uh, is going to be all the way to the kink of the red line. So one of the predictions from this is that when you get, if you want more liquidity today, go shorter. And therefore, the value, the amount of liquidity that you can raise is, is going to go up. Uh, this I call the information insensitive region or debt. And I will come back to the fact what happens when you move outside of that, because that is what is critical for the, for the, uh, for the uh, crisis. So I want to now contrast, and this is an important table, two polar systems. So you take, start with stock markets, which sort of, I said, finance has studied a lot. Let's look at the pieces. They trade in shares, that is equity. There's continuous price discovery, meaning the prices every second you see it on the, on the screens. So there's intense price discovery. Millions and millions of people that are, are, are bidding here and, and uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Different views perhaps, but it all comes down to a price that continuously uh, moves. Of course, there are some illiquid stock. Transparency, a very important part because every change in the dollar value, unlike in the debt contract, matters. So if you learn that this is $100 more or $100 million more, that changes the price. So every minute piece of detail matters. And so there's need for transparency, and, and therefore they are extremely transparent, these markets. They are very information sensitive, which fits the idea that people are collecting information. So if you are a nanosecond before me, you can make money. In fact, we are talking now in units of nanosecond. That's the new technology. They drilled a, a tunnel through the Rocky Mountains for a billion dollars in order to get a couple of nanoseconds off the time it takes for the information to arrive. Now, unfortunately, when it was drilled, they already had a new satellite tech and technology that was better, so it was all wasted money. But that happens. It is centralized. So it's expensive, is my point here. This stuff is expensive in the sense that it's centralized. You have to have a, a, a mechanism for, for getting it. And then it's not urgent, paradoxically. Meaning, if you don't feel like selling, or if you don't feel like buying, you just feel like your model isn't working today, you just can stay out. Nothing dramatic happens. You can sit on your share for a year, two years, three years, nothing much happens. You contrast that to money markets. And, well, let me, before I say, it, this column here, all the pieces fit. So it's like a vehicle which has wheels and, and windows and chassis and everything meant to fit each other. So the, 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 that's a very important part. It's a system. 
Now compare it to the money market system and you see debt. I just showed you what debt looks like. It's flat. It obviates price discovery. That's just the opposite to equity market. It is opaque as an instrument because people won't collect information because there's nothing to collect. If it's safe, it's safe. That's all we need to know. Apart from interest rates which are traded in other markets and we will import to this market. And it is very often historically bilateral, meaning it's over the counter, it's just you and me, you know, and, 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 and we call each other each morning and find out. And very importantly, it is urgent. Because take the repo that has to, it's a one day repo, it has to be rolled over every day. If it doesn't get rolled over every day or more, panic breaks out. And so what happens is within an hour, trillions of dollars get traded over the counter mostly and also in tripartite markets in, in the money markets. So massive volume, stable volume also, unlike for instance. So the point is these are totally different systems. So one of the messages is, for God's sake, don't, the logic of the money market system operates on over-collateralization and not acquiring information or having to do so. That's the whole idea of money markets. If you have to start acquiring information, trouble will break out as we come soon. And that's part of why these guys did not go down to Florida, because they have every day one hour's time to figure out whether to roll it over or not. This is not, a, it doesn't mean they don't think about these worries and so on, but it means that it's a big decision. It doesn't get settled by going down to Florida and look at something. Now, the benefit of this is, big benefit, it's cheap liquidity. It costs very little there. No analysts looking really at money markets for the reason that nothing is happening there. You know, nobody studies whether $100 is $100. There's coarse, you know, pricing in these markets. They are based on ratings and other things. So the urgency, bilateral, all these things also fit. The bilateral perhaps less so, but bilateral is because they are complicated products. There's only one kind of equity, really. There are, uh, there are thousands of types of, 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 of debt. By the way, European Central Bank has about 50,000 different kinds of collateral right now on their books. 50,000 different. And one of the contracts is by Mr. Messi, as we now know. You know, he's owing something. And he's also there at the ECB as collateral for something. I don't know what it is. Hopefully not for Finnish uh, uh, investment. But the point is, it's a rich, and that's where the history of the bilateral nature of these contracts. Now, let me tell you then also some evidence starting again. One is about the evidence about the bears, how do they trail diamonds, the bears wholesale diamonds? Well, they put them, I call them bags, actually, they are envelopes, but the point is they hide, they, they will tell you the five Cs of which I only remember, color, clarity, and, and what is the carrot, and then there's two more that I'm forgetting now. But those are the five gross characteristics. That's what you know. You don't get to open the bag. You don't get to negotiate the price. That's the price, that's what's going to be in. It's some, and, and take it or leave it, okay? Now, it turns out, in reality, you actually can open it in order just to correct that the green, if it was a green, supposed to be green diamonds, it will be green diamonds, and so on. That's a little detail. The point is they, they don't want, the one thing they do prevent if you open the bag and you start saying, hey, this doesn't look like an average quality green, you know, take all those characteristics. This somehow looks like there's more bad looking, you know, I, I would like a little better looking, you know, diamonds. This doesn't seem to me matching the price. They will say, okay, take, here's your money back. By the way, don't come back again. You are allowed to open it if you start inspecting and complaining about the quality of the diamonds, you're out. And you may think, oh, that's arrogant. But what they want is they don't want people to inspect because if people start inspecting, they may be, you know, different. They come in a flow, these traders and so on. This will lead to asymmetric information and that will, uh, at worst, you know, get 
Both envelopes will be slowly you know, moved aside and then, then be not traded. The, to the TBA market, let me say a word about that because it is almost the DBS case. To be, TBA is to be announced market. It's two thirds of the repo market in, I'm sorry, it's not the repo market, it's an it's a asset backed security market in, in the US where you can mortgage secure, but mortgage, uh, mortgages are put in bags and in order to subsequently be used for, for, for collateral. You bid on that contract based on similar growth characteristics as, as I just, the five characteristics I said, you know, what kind of collateral, not where, you know, that's too detailed information, but just what kind of collateral, what rating, you name it, and that's what they put in back. You do it before they have even issued the mortgage. It's not like they're collecting the mortgage. The mortgage has not yet been offered to the person that will end up in your bag. This is the most liquid market in the US. So the, the zero information except intended characteristics. Course credit tracings, money market mutual funds used to delay information. They wouldn't tell you. They knew all the time what their so net asset value is by book. They wouldn't tell you. And then central bank secrecy. Can I ask you, just because I forgot to look, when did I start? Oh, you stay ho the whole night here? We have the musicians still here. We are in good shape. Uh, so here is the dark side of opacity. Obviously, there is a dark side. Somebody's got to know something, okay? It's just that they need not be the five guys from the big short, you know? And so relying on debt, which is an opaque instrument by nature, securitization, course ratings, mechanical rules, they price these instruments very mechanically. That all makes sense in good times. Good times meaning when there's plenty of collateral supporting all this. This is my, this is, you know, the $500 watch, uh, you know, or, or, I'm sorry, the, this is the $100 loan that has behind it, you know, 110 or 120 or $130 of collateral. Think about your own mortgages, you know. They, they, your house is worth a million dollars, you may get 70, se you know, you may get $700,000 of loan. That's another over collateralizing case. When you rely on this over collateralization, you are pushing implicitly risk into the tail because it's flat and then it starts moving only in the tail. So all the risk is in the default part of the tail. And what's worse, it hides also systemic risk. How these different instruments, what happens if the housing market everywhere goes down? It hadn't happened in 70 years in the US which was why people felt so comfortable with having this, you know. The nominal price had just kept going up. That's one of the places where they, they, they failed. And so the social trade-off is cheap by being opaque with instruments, in some cases being opaque about even not telling about the instruments like the TBA market. All that helps, you know, to move, make things more liquid that is more symmetric it's total symmetric ignorance in the TBA market. No experts know anything more than, than pretty much everybody else. But it has the very big cost of a crisis. And so here is the, oops. So debt can become information sensitive. That's the problem. Every, every now and then, in the US case, we can talk about 70 years. You know, things, not just individual contracts, but the whole system can slide into a situation where, where the underlying collateral value drops into that very low probability tail. 99% of the time, things will be the way on more, things will be okay. That's why we aren't asking any questions. But every now and then, or rather rarely, things get information sensitive. The reason I'm drawing this information sensitive, you notice that the, the, it, it, in this region now, 
you are going from actually having the red and black line together, which means that it is exactly worth what it's supposed to pay at the end, to actually going into the region where the market value is strongly detached from the, from the red line. So it isn't worth $100. It is worth maybe $70 or $60 or something like that. That starts to be a region, these kind of detachments from collateral value triggers the desire to find out information. It triggers uh, people to withdraw from the market because they don't know anything. It is actually quite chaotic, the market, because they never prepared them. There was no market, if you think the over-the-counter market. There was no market of price discovery, like the stock market. It takes a lot of centralized trading to get a market going that has price discovery. So they are thrown into a sort of bewildering situation when this happens, when they realize this. They have been in this sort of been a system that has been silent, 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 and suddenly something happened. And so here is a picture of what happened in 2000, uh, July 2007. Uh, this picture is a tranche of, of, of home equity loan. I don't want to go into talking about what it is. It's a double A tranche. It turns out uh, it's a little stuck of the picture. But what you see here is that this is a fitted equation about where sort of gross characteristics have been taken out and people have adjusted prices according to those. And then it shows you how they price it. So this is the residual, the fi fitting residual. And there is no residual, really. So the, the, the model fit is almost perfect. So there is a model that prices this almost exactly right. And it's fitted over the whole time horizon, incidentally. It's important to understand that. So this is both pre-crisis and then after the crisis that occurred around July, uh, uh, July 07. So it's not that we fitted something to data here and then we fit it again after the, after the event. It's across the event. So the model fits well before the event. That is not, this is to be read as saying everybody was on the same page with regard to what the right price is. They used the same implicit price. It was a coarse price, but they used, the, and by the way, there's a mass of evidence showing that this is what happens. The, it's what we call benchmark pricing. I go and look at my screen. What did something trade for yesterday? You know, something like this, and then we, we have a certain system of pricing. That's what here. And you see, then comes the moment when suddenly this fund had to close because the net asset value was starting to go so low. So this had in it, it was a bag where there was asset-backed securities or pieces of them. And then suddenly, you know, there started to be suspicions about the value because the housing market had started to drop. It started to drop already in 2006. And then when the suspicion got sufficiently big, people started to withdraw too much money. So these are bilateral trade, by the way. People uh, started to pull out money, and then when, the, when it happened, suddenly everybody was lost with regard. There was no common understanding of what the price was. There was no shared sense what the value should be. And needless to say, when, when the prices start to move like this, that's a sign of high degree of illiquidity in the market. This comes from Perodin and Wu and... Uh, and uh, so private information suddenly became relevant, or expertise became relevant. And that expertise uh, was, the, was a concern. There's another picture I will drop. So let me say a few words about, you have to give me some time, because I will stick to the time. What is it? So that's uh, too little. Uh, let's start by, no. So let me say something about, so, I'm going to talk about getting out of crisis. I, before I say it, there is also harder evidence of this view. That is, the, this sense, this ha, the one thing that I want to change, is, this is a technical remark. We have always run these prices. The liquidity has always been thought to be uh, something that leads to price declines. That is, liquidity imply if we have illiquid market, the price will drop. And we have literally thousands of regressions running it that way. What this theory suggests 
is that maybe one should write it there in some markets, like money markets, should run it the other way around. Here in this logic, the fact that some fundamental value causes a drop in the collateral will actually drive the, uh, will, will drive the illiquidity, as, as in this picture. And recent data, people are now working this way, the equation. And in money markets, they do find it, that it is exact, it seems to fit. The jury is out which way you should run these regressions. That is, is liquidity causing you know, price declines, or is price declines causing illiquidity? Uh, illiquidity causing price declines, price declines causing illiquidity. Uh, that's out still, but it is a new thought for this literature, to some extent, to think about the other way, and it seems like it is working. And one piece of evidence is that the more liquidity, that is, we have very short-term debt that's liquid, it's dramatic when it starts falling. When it suddenly goes illiquid, it goes like a stone down. So the, the, it's exactly the hockey stick, if you want to call it, that red line. It's exactly what that model will predict. That, that long-term bonds will react much more slowly to sort of news than the short-term, bad news than the short-term ones. I just wanted to throw in that so that you don't think this is just my only piece of evidence. There is actually a, you know, coming in interesting pieces of evidence. And of course, what is definitely true is prices, there is no price discovery in these, in, in these markets. That, that's easy just to find out. People, these prices of, the, it's what they sometimes call matrix pricing, sometimes benchmark pricing. So let me say what this gives. So, you know, you can say, so what? You know, uh, wh wh why should we be interested in this? And the answer is that one very important policy implication, which was neglected uh, initially, is very simple. No questions asked, is the good state of money markets? We don't want eccentric people having to run to Florida to find out about the state of the world. It doesn't matter. We want that it doesn't matter. There were, I'm sure, many eccentric people running down to Florida before, but uh, those were false alarms. In fact, they are only eccentric people in Florida. Uh, the <laughs> no, that's uh, uh, no questions asked. Is the state we want to be in? So don't. Try to open the bags, is the first point. U.S. got money in the crisis. There was 700 billion allocated to the U.S. for bidding on toxic assets. What's the problem? The problem is we have no idea whether 700 billion will buy up enough toxic assets to actually save the system. We have no, there's all sorts of adverse selection problems related to buying up by bidding. You know, they had bi the bidding experts were working hard. And thank God, the Treasury decided to do something entirely different, which is what we call the Scandinavia model. You want to get back to the no questions asked. The root is recapitalize. Again, Badger, the wise man, said, lend without limit. We have, though, I'm going down there and talk about bad banks in Scandinavia crisis. They were saved in Sweden, in Finland, which is how I got originally interested in and what got us with Sean to work, Sean to, to, uh, we did, did work on this crisis. You, you actually, paradoxically enough, you put stuff in bigger bags. You know, you, you, you take those toxic bags and you put in a big bag and then you pour money into it sufficiently that the people feel confident that this will, this, this will be enough to kill the fact that there is some, stoxi some toxic stuff on the bottom. So you just, over you just move the, over the, the distribution that I suggested somebody. And the only party that can do that, by the way, in a crisis is the government. There is nowhere else funds really to go. And uh, this... Uh, this is the recommendation in, in Scandinavia. You don't give any information out. That held also true for Scandinavia. Uh, what, the, what happened in, in, uh, in the US was that uh, 
they actually did open the, up the banks. They took the 18 or was it 19 banks. They just decided we are going to save the core. Forget about those small banks. Let's just make sure that the center is solid. They re-collateralized the 19 banks. Not all of those banks needed funds, but that was the decision. And they put, as I recall, about $80 billion into the bag, uh, into the various banks, different amounts to different banks. They did not tell how much they put into the different banks. Opacity, you notice? They didn't want to single out somebody. They forced everybody to take money so that it wouldn't look like people would say, oh, Bank of America is really in trouble. They could have gone actually and looked at the, it turns out afterwards, they could have gone and looked at the stock price. It would have been a good predictor of it being in trouble. So somebody knew something. But the point is that they had to open the bags in order to convince a sufficiently big fraction of traders, this is the wholesale market is really central here, the traders that that's sufficient that the system wouldn't have a run. And that stayed off the run. Subsequently, they didn't show as much in these so-called stress tests. They went into more opacity, but this, I don't think of this transparency, I think, as a special case, when you lose all your sort of credibility, so to speak, then you have to show that if I put enough money in there. The US versus you, another example of this was that the Europeans, uh, the Eurozone, struggled with, of course, with the, with the Greek debt for a long time. You know, they said, we have 100 billion, ECB, you know, the fund. And I may have my numbers wrong, but I give you just the sense. Then they raised it to 200 or 300 billion, then 500 billion. Eventually, you know, they figure out they, they have actually a trillion euros worth of money to pour into this bank, into, the, into this situation. Nothing happened to the spreads. The market were just as no, they were completely unfazed by the, unimpressed by this increasing amount of money. You know, this is budget saying when a banker has to show that, you know, we have enough money, you are already in trouble. They were in trouble. Then comes Draghi around. What does he do? No new numbers. He actually just says, whatever it takes, we'll do whatever it takes, and you better believe it. Boom, all the spreads fell down, you know, to, to pre-crisis level. And pretty much have stayed there except for, you know, recent. So do you see there are two things? It's obvious he had talked to Chancellor Merkel. People inferred that she had underwritten part of it in some way or another, or at least approved that, you know, ECB can do something dramatic. I don't know the details. I don't know that anybody knows the details. But there's another aspect of it which I want to f f emphasize. She did not, he did not go and ask that it's three trillion, maybe for political reasons. But it is actually, in my view, important that he said, whatever it takes. That's as opaque a statement as you can make. And the beauty of the whatever it takes is you can take that sentence and put it into a spreadsheet and start calculating what it means. Nobody knows what it means, which means all the experts are as ignorant as you and me of what it means. And it may even include Draghi himself, but probably knows more and has ideas. But the point is, you know, that was implicitly putting in the bag a lot of money and at least have a, a, a commitment and then not telling precisely what it is because God knows we can get closer to the boundary, you know, the three trillion or whatever, and then we have problems again. They are running out of time, by the way. This is a little side comment here. That is, I think that bought a lot of time, and not much has happened, in, in my view, uh, in the, or more should have happened with regard to this. Uh, I wanted to say about clearing houses from the 19th century, which is our best reference, in my view, today, to how to deal with crisis. And all I want to say is that in clearing houses was completely private insurance arrangements. So all the New York banks or the big New York banks had an arrangement that said, we are separate banks, that's the decentralized part. We issue individual debt, that is individual money. In those days, you issued notes. They were, they were 
each bank you had to cash it in on different, from different banks, IOUs, and they were somewhat transparent. Banks are never transparent, but somewhat transparent about what they gave yearly reports and or maybe I think it was yearly or half yearly reports of, of where each bank stood. Then one bank has a run, which happened about every 10 years or so. Then that's called, that's a crisis state. The whole system closes and becomes one. No more information to anybody. The guys, the other guys who, whose bank are still healthy say, we take care of this problem. And they had great, in the contract of insurance, they had great rights to liquidate or do whatever they wanted with the bank that was almost with the bank that failed. But they committed themselves to serving all the debt, mutualize all the debt that had been issued from this system. And eventually, and this opacity is again very important here. They did not say any more about the individual banks in order to maintain a sense of, of symmetry. So, uh, and then when the crisis went over, eventually the, the, uh, the, the clearinghouse uh, traded at, at par, then, then they, went back to the, they went back to the normal times. And it's a very interesting question. Why did they go back to the normal times since the thing worked in the crisis time? Why not stay there in that sense? And I leave it, leave it to your, your uh, thoughts. I have an answer. Others have other answers. And if you don't like those, I have more answers. Uh, uh, on, so my bottom line about the cr getting out of a crisis is actually something we know how to do. I think we have proved time and again there were like 10 crises in the 19th century. They get bad because the real economy is hit hard. But nobody really loses in the aggregate money in the end. No, neither, by the way, does the, the government lose. In, in the Finnish crisis, the government made some money on the banking part of it. The real economy was a different story. On preventing crisis, I think that's where we have a lot of problems. Here is another paradoxical thing of this view. More transparency in good times may be, means, more transparency means less liquidity in this money market because it has the potential of having this asymmetry of information. So people may get cautious. But that transparency may be good exactly because there is less liquidity. Because one of the problems for a crisis is that before the crisis, there is just too much liquidity. So you may not want to have money market mutual funds in a situation where they can act like banks and therefore create a lot of liquidity, and that was part of the problem. So I'm all for what they have now done, which is actually taken out the banking character of money market mutual funds. They have now announced uh, daily, I think it's daily now, or short of that, they can't make any more commitments to, to, to paying back a, a dollar. I believe stress tests and transparency, uh, it, it, stress tests are very important. Not sure they should be transparent. In fact, I'm of the view that they shouldn't be very transparent. Stress test means the government comes and, and, and here you see the difference between the EU and, and US. The, the critical thing about stress test, if you make a stress test, you better have money to put in if you find that there is lacking. EU's catastrophe was that they opened the bags eventually to the Greek, the information on, on exposure to Greek loans. And in my view, that was a big part of where the crisis started in the European Union. They had nothing to put in there, in the bags. They were transparent, but didn't have a solution. I think that's the worst of outcomes. So if you are transparent like the US was, then you also have to have the money with which you are solving it. I'm, I'm rushing a little market discipline, you know, is advocated by a lot. I'm so dominated in my thinking about the no questions asked that I just don't believe. You can be transparent about banks when times are good, but things like CDS and ABX were grossly mispricing these, these units because they didn't have enough liquidity in the market. Cocos, which I think are contingent convertibles, is that correct? Contingent convertibles is an idea that let's recapitalize, so to have a contract that says that if a bank runs into trouble 
or some other instrument, then the people who have bought contingent convertibles, which is a debt contract, it will convert into equity so that they give up their right to collect the debt in order. So that sounds like a wonderful idea, automatically. You know, if, if we need more equity, we are getting, we have too little collateral, then let's just take off the load. Let's just reduce the debt by shifting into equity. Well, we got, I was critical of this because there's another side to it. A cocoa, if it starts converting, it's like an alarm bell. It's like a, it's a canary in the coal mine that we are in trouble. So there's the systemic risk aspect of it that says cocos will do nothing to deal with systemic risk because they are like peanuts in terms of money. You need, when a systemic risk, a, a forest fire starts, you need something much higher. And we have seen now twice cocos, you know, how trigger happy they are. I don't know what the judgment is going to be, but uh, we saw it in Deutsche Bank recently. And we saw it, what was the other bank in the February? There was, uh, there was some other banks. You know, markets get nervous, the cocos get triggered, get triggered, makes, makes the market nervous, and then we see, you know, something that could potentially become a forest fire. So I'm very much in the camp of higher capital requirements, like Helwig, Admati and Helwig. Uh, I just don't think they have the argument fully put forward. I think this is an argument for higher capital ratios. How high, nobody really knows, but it's simple and robust. And the liquidity coverage ratio is too complicated to explain here, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of taking out a lot of collateral, of which I think there is currently a shortage. That is, you are sucking out the treasuries out of the market by forcing this to hold. So what we are seeing, in, at least in Scandinavia, is as soon as the government takes out collateral, you know, s private parties start putting in. So you see a lot of covered bonds being issued, in fact, massive amounts being issued in Finland and in Sweden. And that means they are funding a lot of, of, of uh, housing because they need, that's the raw material from which you are issuing covered bonds. And, uh, and that uh, many people feel that is actually a... Uh, uh, it's really a replay in many people's view of what happened to the US waiting to happen in, in Scandinavia. I don't have a very strong view on it. Let me, uh, let me say that I have thoughts about when is opacity. I want to make clear, it's not like opacity is always good. I'm not advocating that. It's not that somebody's got to know something. That's clear. My view is that the government or that type of agency is, is the relevant type of agency that needs to, to see something. So uh, don't read it as saying, you know, let's just not tell anything to anybody or anything. That's, somebody's got to know something. But we can't rely on, on, on people, people, people. In my view, we can't rely on market uh, discipline because the market is not interested in the information. So. Concluding remarks, don't use stock markets as reference. That's got to be a true fact. You cannot possibly take the insights from stock markets, which is 90% of finance or 95%, and apply it to money markets. You've got to start thinking anew about the problem. I said already that no, no questions asked, limited information in money markets is very much part and parcel of how that market is supposed to work. Uh, it goes hand in hand with the financial crisis because when you shift from the I don't know anything into oh my god I need to know something that's a financial crisis it's an information event and then we have the big question about systemic risk to which I don't have an answer I don't think very many others have an answer you know stress test try to figure out I think stress test is the best answer we have right now but I, it's worth noting a paradox which is that the safer the system becomes, the more you are creating no questions asked liquidity. And therefore, potentially you are setting, so not even potentially, you are setting yourself up eventually for a big crisis in which the government has a very critical role to play. So my last remark is, if people dislike what has happened in the US, it was, 70, it was running 70 years without a really serious financial crisis. 
give me a system that gives another 70 years without the crisis to US, and I will be paying a billion dollars if I had it. Thank you very much.